laws that give effect to the idea of fairness. And in doing so, it is shown just how fragile are the laws and their application that we assume to protect us when faced with a government determined to take a contrary path. You know, our generation has had the most sophisticated development of international laws, treaties and conventions the international community has ever known, all stating that human rights abuses will not be tolerated. These international instruments include the Geneva Conventions, the Convention on Torture, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and so on, all applicable to Omar Khadr and other detainees in Guantanamo Bay, and all denied to them. I often describe, in a cynical way, human rights law as being pretty all dressed up, but nowhere to go. As a signatory to all these international treaties, Canada has an obligation to protest when they're not being applied to one of its citizens. And yet, it has continued to pick and choose when to uphold its obligations under international law. These are hard times, I suggest. And my legal journey, unfortunately, has been a sober reminder about the very limits of justice itself. We are witnesses to habeas corpus being abandoned, secret courts being created to hear secret evidence. I spent a lot of time in Canadian secret courts. Guilt and fair by association, torture and rendition nakedly justified, and vital international conventions consolidated in the aftermath of the Second World War, the Geneva Conventions, the Refugee Convention, the Torch Convention and more, have been deliberately avoided or ignored in the war on terror by liberal Western governments and others, and in particular our own, Canada. Canada has never, ever criticised Guantanamo Bay never said a single word that that's a bad place. And I would say to you, to you that one would never have envisaged that the history of the new century would encompass the destruction and the distortion of fundamental legal and constitutional principles that have been in place since the 17th century. That we appear to have forgotten the lesson or the lessons of the Star Chamber where the accused were submitted to torture, to accusations based on secret evidence, heard by a secret court, while being shackled and in extremes of isolation. And the worst successes of the past year should have sounded a loud alarms to all of us, not the least because of that precise historic parallel to the Star Chamber. And, you know, one has to look no further than Guantanamo Bay, where individuals have been arbitrarily detained for years without being charged. I think there have been about four trials. Without access to courts, to jams of detention. Where there's no civilian oversight to the numerous credible allegations of torture and abuse. And I say this to anyone and everyone. These descriptors should come as no surprise to anyone here tonight. Because it was in January 2002 that we all saw the first shocking images of human beings in roles, in aircraft, hooded, shackled for transportation across the Atlantic. Much as other human beings had been carried in slave ships 400 years earlier. When we watched those images of the transportation of those prisoners to Guantanamo, we, wished that we witnessed that the captors humiliating these anonymous human beings and loaded at Guantanamo Bay 
crouched in open cages in their orange jumpsuits, all deliberately displayed for the world to see. And amongst them was Omar Carter, a 15-year-old Canadian. And for the watching world, no knowledge of international humanitarian conventions was needed to understand that what was being witnessed was simply unlawful. This was not a manifestation of the Geneva Conventions at work, nor was it an act of deportation or extradition. It was far worse. It was the unlawful transportation to a world outside the reach of law and intended to remain so, as it does to today. In that world, crimes against inhumanity would be carried out over the many, many years. Grand Guantanamo is an affront to the rule of law. It has been condemned by nations, jurors, human rights organizations, members of US Congress, but not by our Canadian government. And when I talk about the cages, I should tell you that Omar spent very little time in the cages. Because we know when you talk about the, the secret prisons that are in one time. Three that I know of, two that I've been in, they were just concrete edifices in the desert, surrounded by, surrounded by wire, cold, damp, horrible places. And if I had time, I would tell you how I first met Omar in one of those places, but I don't. And yet, throughout it all, I've never wavered despite the innumerable legal challenges placed before me by hostile governments more interested in covering up their egregious misconduct than being committed to transparency and openness. It is my simple belief, as tried as it may sound, that the right to justice is a universal entitlement of every human being, irrespective of nationality, color, race, or creed. I've always viewed law as a great equalizer. Still, whether to promote justice and individual liberty, liberty or simply as a restraint upon excessive power, And I continue to view law not as the enemy of liberty, but its partner. And I remind you what, what the political philosopher Edmund Burke once described as civil, as civil society. He said it was a partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to come. That is the mantra that we should be considering. And it's this commitment to the rule of law that has allowed me to keep my promise to Omar, not to walk away. Notwithstanding, there have been numerous times when I have become exhausted by the journey or ashamed at the extent to which I have put my fi family's financial security at risk. I never ever thought I would be described as a, a pro bono lawyer. I have been funded through my family and my own earnings and none of my wife. Ten years on. We built, started building a house that we had to abandon. And yet through it all along, all that I've missed my sons, both of my sons' graduations or birthdays. I know the family time. And yet my wife Patricia <clears throat> and my children Cameron and Duncan have truly stood alongside me. Because they understand 
that it simply is the right